Welcome to the 401k Audit CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping companies across the United States prepare for their 401k audit. If you have 100 eligible participants in your 401k plan, then this podcast is for you. Welcome, everyone, to our 401k plan audit, CPA audit success show podcast for this month. I'm Kim Moore. I'm the audit director here at Anders. Um, Just for those who may be joining us for the first time, we are a CPA firm located out of St. Louis, um, but my team is actually virtual. So we work um, all over the country and we have clients all over the country. Um, I'm joined today by Karen Hill, the manager on the team, and we have a a new team member that's joining us today, Chris. Kristen Cortez. Kristen's a audit supervisor on our team. So welcome to both of you guys. Happy to have you here. Um, today we are going to talk about something a little bit different than we've talked about before. Um, this is something that's been coming up in a lot of our audits recently. So we thought it would be a good topic um, to get out there for all of you guys. And the topic is key controls. Um, Key controls are important in an audit, uh, but they're also very important for a business and for a 401k plan. Um, I'm going to first start off by saying we're going to focus on 401k plans because obviously that's what we deal with primarily. Um, But if you happen to be listening to this, key controls relate to any kind of business and they relate to any kind of audit. So uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about in general would apply to any audit or any financial area um, that you might be dealing with. But we're going to focus specifically on 401k plans and especially 401k plan key controls or controls areas that we'd want to focus on. So uh, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as as we move forward. Um, and lastly, before I we kind of get started here, I want to throw out my email address. It's the letter K, then more. So K-M-O-O-R-E at Anders with an S, A-N-D-E-R-S, C-P-A.com. Again, it's K-M-O-O-R-E at A-N-D-E-R-S, C-P-A.com. If you have any questions about what we're talking about today, if you're interested in learning more about Anders or more about our 401k plan audit process, um, if you have an idea for our future podcast also, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me and um, I'll get back to you and um, we can talk about whatever your question or your Uh, area of interest is. So with that, let's talk about key controls. Karen, you want to kind of first off tell us what is a key control? Well, key control is an action that um, the personnel, the the company personnel takes to in order to identify, detect, or prevent an error in the plan's financial statements. In this case, it would be in the 401k plan. Um, You have controls that are company, uh, like the, they're either process based or they're company based. There's, they could be various different things. And you will have more controls than what we consider key controls, but you know the only those that would pre- prevent or detect the significant errors are considered key. So mm-hmm. while you there's various levels, there are various things that you do in the pro- in your transaction processing that might be considered a control, like I said the, the key controls are there, there's the, a few of them. Mm-hmm. And also, oh, I'm sorry, were you going to say Oh, that? no, I was just going to say, yeah, the, the other thing I was going to add in is that from a company standpoint or a process standpoint, as Karen said, there, there could be thousands of controls actually um, within any given process or any given business. Um, we're really focused from a financial statement perspective. And also because, again, we're 401k, so there's a lot of regulatory um, potential problems, uh, the regulations that that a plan has to adhere to. So also from a compliance standpoint. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to either focus on the financial statements themselves, the disclosures in the financial statements, or a compliance type issue that we want to make sure gets covered. But just keep in mind that controls cover everything. And so mm-hmm. you could have controls around effectiveness of something and making sure something is efficient. Um, those wouldn't necessarily, they may be key controls too, and depending on how you're looking at things. But for our purposes, again, we're auditors. So we're really focused on the financial statements and again, compliance. So a lot of this stuff is going to be geared around that. If you're going to hear a theme here, um, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that all your controls would be focused that way though too. So just kind of want to clarify that. Mm-hmm. 
and they're, they're, we're going to probably more likely that they're going to be related to the larger balances or the significant balances in your financial statements, which doesn't mean that you wouldn't have controls over the smaller balances, but they're not usually considered key. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, that, I don't know if that, depending on your background, that may make a lot of sense. Um, but again, it may not, you might be like, I don't, don't what are you talking about? <laughs> so um, I thought I would just give some examples here of um, what could be considered a key control. Now, also understand that a key control is going to vary um, depending on whatever you're, you're focused on. It's going to depend on the business. Um, it's going to depend on how, in our case, the 401k plan is set up. So these wouldn't all apply there. Some are going to apply different ways. So, so there any plan that you look at, it is going to be different. So there, this is one thing where it's not the same in every case. Um, but one good example, segregation of duties, um, that's a good control when you have more than one person involved in something. Um, from a fraud perspective, which we always talk about, you if you've heard some of our podcasts, you'll hear us talk about fraud a lot. Um, from a fraud perspective, it's more difficult to perpetrate a fraud when there's multiple people involved because one person is 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 going to see it. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult um, to cover it up. Now, we get into management override of controls and then it's a whole different story. But in general, segregation of duties is good because it, it does help um, with the fraud risk element, which we have to consider with financial statements. Um, the other thing with segregation of duties, so it's always good to have more than one person involved in anything because the second person is looking at what the first person did. So they're more likely to say, hey, wait a minute, what you said two and two are six, what, what's that? Um, but it's also good because we all want to take vacations. We might get sick. Uh, something might come up. There might be emergency. Um, so if you've got more than one person involved too, it's also just good from a backup perspective to have a second person that, that can mm -hmm. jump in and, and take over, you know, if need be. Um, so yeah. that's one example of a control. Yeah. And as an auditor, if you have one person that processes payroll and they're taking payroll with you, with them on to do on vacation, as an auditor, that's going to give me pause. I'm going to say, wait a minute. Why does nobody cover for this person when they go on vacation? And I mean, I've seen it. I've had in, in the past with a 401k plan where they found out that the payroll person was committing fraud because she would not let anybody else cover for her mm -hmm. when she was on vacation. Yeah. A lot of uh, financial institutions require everybody to take vacations for that very reason, just because they will uncover fraudulent activity when the person is gone. And, and I mean, Karen's absolutely right. When somebody, you see somebody that's holding on to something and they won't, they won't let somebody else be involved. It's, there's usually something going on there. It may not be fraud, but mm -hmm. there is usually something, something going on there. Um, a second key control that we, we use a lot, we see a lot, um, and is a, a very good key control is authorization or approval. Um, so that could be someone in your, you know, the trustee of your 401k plan reviewing all the distributions. Um, so the participants made a request for a distribution and they're looking at it to verify that it's appropriate, that they know that person is eligible to receive that distribution. Um, they're not saying, well, who is this person? I, they've never worked here. You know, obviously that would be another fraudulent type of transaction. Um, so an authorization is a good uh, control approval over something. So that might be um, just someone reviewing a second review and they're saying, yep, I've looked at this and I'm, I'm kind of signing off saying that's okay. Um, those those are all really good controls. We have a, a lot of our key controls that we see on the 401k plan side. And even in payroll, um, you'll see that. So authorization for a pay raise, um, authorization for someone to work overtime, uh, authorization for someone to receive a bonus. You know, those, those kinds of things come up a lot. So um, another one, Kristen, reconciliations. You tell us just a little bit of what, what, is, a, what is a reconciliation. So, you know, a reconciliation is where somebody is going to go in and verify that the activity that happened actually agrees to the source documents and to the activity that has taken place, the financial activity. Um, and for employee benefit plans, we're, we're mainly looking to see that 
you know, the deferrals remitted, the loan repayments remitted, actually agree to the payroll registers. And we can trace those funds to the bank statements and to eventually the record keeper and determine that what was remitted, it was actually received by the plan and allocated correctly to the participant accounts. So. Right. Yeah. And, you know, reconciliations are, are important. Um, you'll, you'll see those just in general in your company. Um, things, I mean, we're all familiar with the bank reconciliation, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, those are, they're, we, they're kind of nothing. So they just go on and you happen and, and people don't, don't really think about them, but they are actually a good control. Uh, Cause if something's going on, a lot of times it's going to it's going to fall out in cash. So mm -hmm. so if you if you're doing a regular bank recon and it's just pretty clean then um it doesn't doesn't mean nothing's going on, but it's a good idea that that you know you don't have some things happening that you that you're not familiar with. They um, also help, they, I'm sorry. They also no, help no, go ahead. finding, you know, items that are missing, you know, missing deposits, um missing deferrals, things like mm -hmm. that. So. Yeah, and on the 401k side it's the recons are good because you're taking money out of a participant's paycheck and ultimately sending that into whoever your record keeper custodian is um, into that employee's participant account. Um, and you want to make sure that all of that money gets across. So a recon would detect that I withdrew $1,000 out of this week's payroll. But wait a minute, over in the 401k plan, they've only got $800. Um, you know, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. So, so recons are, are really good. Um, even with automated processes sometimes, you know, the system can glitch right in the middle of a send. Uh, and so something happens and it doesn't all get across. Doesn't happen a lot, but it, it does happen even in today's day and age. So um, recons are, are a really good control. Um, they, they serve a lot of purposes. So it's a, another good one that we like to rely on. And I think they go well with segregation of duties. You really want somebody who's not performing payroll to actually reconcile payroll, you know? Right. Yeah. Very good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That would, that would, uh, that would be a problem and would, uh, would kind of negate some of the benefits of the control if the same person's doing it. Um, another one I like to point out, um, which doesn't come up anymore a lot, but it's physical security. Um, so, you know, we, you know, in the old days when you cut paper checks, this was kind of a big deal. Who had control over the checks and were they just laying around? Could somebody grab a check? Um, but, you know, physical security in today's world um, could be over things like payroll or HR information. If you still have paper HR files, which a lot of companies still do, um, you know, that's not something we would necessarily look at in the audit, but it is a, a very important control. And, and it could be a key control, just depending on uh, what kind of information is maintained in those files. But again, you know, you, you don't want people's personal information laying around. And you don't even want it in an office with an unlocked, unlocked file cabinet either, because just a you know, visitor could come in and start rifling through it. Or, or an unlocked office. You know, the payroll person, if they leave their office and their computer is on, maybe they left the login, you know, they didn't log out. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you it, it, we see very much when you physically go to places, pay, the payroll folks should be in an office. They shouldn't be just out in a cubicle out in the middle of the floor with everybody else. They should be segregated. Um, and the other thing, Karen, you bring up a very good point. The, the physical security doesn't have to be physical as in a piece of paper. Um, how are you securing your HR payroll files if they're electronic? I mean, are you just running the payroll report each pay period and you throw it out on the, the generic, you know, file structure that everybody has access to? Well, there's, you know, you got a problem because anybody could go in and look and see, oh, Susie makes so much, you know, Susie does the same job I do, but Susie makes more money than me. Um, so, you know, it, it can cause you all kinds of problems. Um, HR files, obviously, there's very confidential information in those files. You wouldn't want those uh, to be just on your regular shared drive that everybody can see. So, um, so physical security can extend beyond just the physical pieces of paper, but um, security in general is, is just a very um, important control. Um, talking about uh, computers, one of the last examples here that I listed, which again are controls people just forget about, but there are controls built into your automated systems. So things like an edit, 
um, you know, you're working through your system and it knows this is supposed to be a date, it's probably coded with an edit. So if you start typing in letters, it's going to say, uh, uh I can't take that. That's, you know, I, I'm expecting numbers in a date. Uh, it may expect a date in a certain format. So if you try to give it something else, you know, a digits after a period, you know, like a number would be, uh, it's going to say, I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, so edits are, are really useful in a system. We kind of forget about them because, you know, we're all working on automated systems all day anymore and they're just built in and you don't even, um, you, you, they're just there. You don't even think about them. But, but those actually are very good controls and very preventative controls. They're going to stop you from doing uh, typos, um, you know, before they get recorded. So, um, so those are just some examples of controls. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, controls here, specific 401k plans in a minute. Um, so why are they important? Um, obviously, they're important because they help prevent mistakes. They help um, detect frauds that may be going on. Um, for an audit, they're important because they help us as auditors uh, know that that the processes are working fairly well. So we can look at the financial statements and the compliance activities that are going on and make the assumption going in as we're developing our procedures um, that that all of the financial statements, the compliance of that they're going to be correct. There's not, we're not starting from a point that we're assuming the financial statements are wrong. We can assume that they're hundred percent correct. Um, if we didn't have that baseline, um, then we would have to do a whole lot more work. Um, you know, our audits would cost a lot more. Um, probably none of us would be here because we'd be get, get sick of just doing the same one client for months because that's what, that's what it would take to do them. So um, it's just kind of a built-in process built into the audit process. But uh, we want to make sure that that baseline is there. That way we can rely on that. And then we're going to build our audit processes on top of that. Um, so Karen, do you want to walk us through, I'm an, I'm an auditor, um, I'm getting started in an audit, I did my ba basic planning, so I've planned out kind of the audit and how it's going to go, but what, how would I even get into this key control? At what, how does that come into play? Well, first you would have to, to, to discuss the different processes with the client and determine how they go about doing the different things. How do they... Uh, when somebody's hired, how do they enter them into the systems? And what paperwork do they use? Um, just basically all, everything that happens around the, the process. And then you're going to determine what the key controls are. So, for example, you want to make sure the demographic data is accurate going into the payroll system and the record keeping system, which would be you know, hire date and birth date. So, what do they use to put those, those um, into? the system and you can you support it so then what you after you get your different controls you say okay well they filled out an i9 an and i'm going to put those dates in because that's the day to hire maybe it's not an i9 maybe they have new hire paperwork that they have all that information and that's what they use to put in well then the your auditor is going to after they get figure out what all the key controls are or your processes then determine the key controls. They're gonna come in and they're gonna conduct a walkthrough of those controls. And what that means is they're gonna take one transaction and they're gonna go through the process and make sure that all of that was done accurately and that the control exists. And that might mean that they're gonna grab that I-9 and they're gonna check the dates on the I-9 and see if that agrees to what's in, in the, the record keeper system. or one of your controls uh, surrounding payroll is that somebody does a review of the payroll. They're going to ask to see the review, proof of the review of the payroll. Um, you know, maybe somebody, maybe your distribution, somebody signs off on the distribution. So they're going to want to see that approval from the distribution request. So they're going to do a walkthrough and try to make sure that those key controls not only are they, that they're actually in place, that somebody is actually doing them. And this is different from the test controls. The test controls, you're gonna do usually at least 25 of them. For a walkthrough, you're only gonna, you're only gonna do one. Mm -hmm. But just wanna make sure that the control is designed correctly and that it's in place. Yeah, and you know, the, 
if you go kind of back to the audit methodology, uh, the whole point of this is that, you know, we, we get in, we understand from the client, here's how things work. We're identifying those key controls. And then we want to make sure that they actually are operating the way that they've told us that they do. As long as that all goes through and, you know, they really, they are working the way that they were described and we feel like, yeah, those are adequate controls to cover the major risks that, that we've identified. Um, that allows us then to, to kind of stop at that point, to, to develop our, our standard testing procedures, do our standard sampling, and we move forward. If for some reason we feel like there's not adequate control, the controls are there are some controls, but they're just not designed very well. Or they might have been designed well, but that's not really what's happening. Uh, you know, someone is supposed to approve something and sign off, and and we go pull our walkthrough, and it's like, well, wait a minute, where's the sign off? Oh, you know, well, the manager's supposed to do that, but they've been busy, and so they haven't been reviewing anything. Well, now we can't rely on that control because it's not really occurring. Um, or you might look at a reconciliation that Kristen talked about earlier and, okay, great, they got this reconciliation. You go in and you look at the one and it's like, well, wait a minute, there's, you know, two and two are eight and then I subtracted four and, you know, and you're like, well, th this isn't even right. This isn't mm -hmm. really doing the job of the reconciliation. So at that point, then we would have to back up and say, okay, we thought we knew the processes. We thought we had these key controls. But in reality, we really don't because they're not working the way that they were designed or they're just not working at all. They're just not not doing the control. Um, so it really the, these whole key controls, the walkthroughs, all of this is, is really important because it determines what processes we need to use in the audit and what sampling that we need to do in the audit. One thing that, that we haven't kind of talked about is um, materiality. Um, materiality is a, is a process that all auditors use, so any any audit, it uh, doesn't have to be 401k, um, will have a materiality calculation. I'm not going to go through all the details of it, but basically the, the auditor is looking at whatever the entity is that they're auditing, in this case the 401k plan, we use the um, net plan asset balance. So what was the ending assets, the ending investments in the plan as of the end of the year? subtracting out any amounts that are that are due to be paid out and uh, and then we're we're kind of looking at that from a total perspective and you know if if I have 20 million dollars in assets am I going to worry about a dollar mistake probably not you know that's we don't want to design our procedures to try to find a dollar because that audit would take a long time and would cost a lot of money for the client and it's unnecessary you know, the readers of the financial statements don't care that it's a dollar off. Now, do they care that it's a million dollars off? Probably. So that's really what, like I said, I don't want to get into all the details of the calculations. And there's different, there's different types of materiality. I'm not going to get into all the details. But the materiality comes into play here because we're not going to go chase processes that are below that level of materiality. Um, it could be wrong that the number that's there could be wrong but not to the extent that it's above that calculation that we did. Um, same thing with the key controls. We're not going to go chase key controls in an area that's you know, not going to generate an error that's large. So the materiality plays into this as well. Um, and we also will look at the, um, the key controls and the, and the walkthrough. And, and so it may not be quite working the way it's designed. Um, but again, that materiality will, will factor into it. What, what is that impact? And does that cause us concern that those higher level errors wouldn't be either prevented or detected? It kind of all fits together if you think if you think about it. So, so materiality does play in. So if your if your auditor seems to be digging really deep, you might want to be asking them about their materiality calculation and just how how did they determine what level of um, items that they need to look at because because that's where that comes from. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit, and we've, we've kind of hit a couple of these already, but some areas um, for 401k plans that are really important and where we, we typically see key controls. Um, uh, Karen, you talked about the demographic data, but mm -hmm. uh, you want to talk a little bit about compensation, because I think that's an area where we've yeah. talked before. We tend to see errors and... <laughs> Yeah, compensation definitely is where we tend to see the most issues in conducting the audit. And 
we just want to make make sure that the compensation. I mean, when you when you, we get into our testing, we're looking to make sure the proper types of compensation are used. But first of all, you want to make sure that the calculation is accurate, and that includes looking at um, if there's a pay rate increase or somebody's hired and they you know what they were hired at. Just to make sure. That that information that's authorized that was put into the payroll system correctly. And it goes to time cards as well, because you're going to have, if somebody is an hourly employee, you want to make sure that the time that they are, that they work, that they're paid for. And if there's overtime involved, that that's calculated correctly. So it, it goes into the controls around making sure that the payroll is calculated correctly. It's processed correctly and so that that you don't have to go back in and, and correct a lot of errors and then since that is the bulk of that payroll is so important to our testing that is a really important thing for us to get a handle on mm -hmm. as far as controls and i think can i say something that sure, absolutely go ahead <laughs> And I think it's a good remind. It's a good time to remind uh, auditors that you know this is where I think materiality doesn't really play a big role because if you're looking at the participant data information and the compensation, you know you find it even if it's just a typo. It might just be a typo. They transpose the numbers in, when they were entering the new rate. Well, that has a snowball effect throughout the year, mm -hmm. and those deferrals and that comp will be off. And that's where you know materiality doesn't play a role that like you, you need to be able to fix that right. or have the team fix right. that. Right. 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 Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's where the compliance element of it comes in. Um, mm -hmm. So I always tell people, you know, if, if I withhold $50 from you out of your payroll and I don't, you know, I don't put it into your account, you know, if does $50 on a $20 million plan matter? No, probably not. Mm -hmm. But to that individual, does the $50 matter? Yeah, probably. It probably does. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, Kristen, you're absolutely right. Um, the the materiality when you're looking from a compliance and a participant level, yes, uh, is very a different calculation. Now, yeah. we might say materiality at a participant level for fifty cents. We're not gonna we're not gonna chase it because that could be rounding. But mm -hmm. we use personally here at the firm, we use a dollar. Yes, and I so, and I have had instances where I'm questioning and somebody over well wait a minute i calculated it it's this and you actually this is what you withheld and it's off by three dollars i'm like well that can't be material like well something's off here and that goes yeah. into what i kind of alluded to a little bit earlier is the definition of compensation that's actually used for the deferrals you want to make sure that if um like we've seen instances where overtime was excluded, but it's not supposed to be excluded. They they didn't include it or bonuses. Bonuses is a big one where mm -hmm. they, they mess up. Either they <laughs> are calculating the deferrals on the bonuses or and they're not supposed to, or vice versa. They're not supposed to and they and they do calculate right. on it. And when you get into uh, some of these fringe benefits that most of them don't allow, but then you have group term life and it can get can, very it, complicated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you have to remember, too, is that we're kind of looking at things at, at for the area we're talking about at two different levels. So we're looking at it for our individual, in this case, a walkthrough of one participant. So we're looking at that one participant. But we're also looking at it from a, a systematized um, standpoint. So if if you are excluding bonuses, if, you, if you're just saying, I mistakenly thought I could exclude bonuses from deferrals, even though if I looked at my plan document, it doesn't allow me to exclude them, but I thought it was okay to exclude them. And maybe I talked to the people, you know, just in the hall and they said, oh yeah, I'm getting this bonus. And by the way, I don't, don't take anything out of it. You know, you got to take taxes, but don't take anything else out. And you're like, well, yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a nice thing, and I'm just, I'm gonna make sure I shut that off so that they don't, there are no deferrals coming out of it. Um, you know, that's a problem, and it's gonna happen for everybody. The same thing if you're, if you set your system, which believe it or not, we've actually seen where systems are set so uh, sick days or vacation days or overtime don't get deferred on. 
you know, got set by mistake. That was not intended to be that way, but it just by mistake got set that way. Well, everybody that takes a vacation now, that pay, which is just regular pay, it's just coded as vacation, uh, is now gonna, not going to have deferrals. And so, yeah, for that one person, it's important, and but maybe it's 50 bucks or something. But when you start multiplying that across the entire population of a whole year of everybody taking vacation, you know, that that can end up being pretty big number and pretty big mm -hmm. error. So so those are the other. Um, and that's really the point of the walkthrough is so that we're making sure that it's set up properly. Yes, we're going to come back and we're going to we're going to do our testing and we're going to test a, a bigger number of participants. But it does give us comfort that we know that the system is set up right, and we shouldn't be seeing that across the board. If if we're seeing an error like that in the one walkthrough, then we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in the testing digging into it because we already know it's probably going to be wrong for everybody. Because that's just how systems work. So um, I'm going to hit an, another just couple uh, issues here or, or items that we've been seeing a lot in our um, audits recently. Um, one of the areas that we look at is is overall monitoring, oversight, um, review of the plan, not on an individual transaction level, but overall in general. So uh, usually um, companies will have maybe a once a year, sometimes it's um, twice a year, sometimes it's quarterly, uh, meeting with an investment advisor and they'll look at the investments in the plan. Um, they'll also do other reviews of other things. They'll talk about um, new options that are out there for plan documents. Maybe we want to consider those or maybe we don't. Um, they'll talk about any kind of problems that they've had or, you know, how are we thinking about our providers? Are they giving us the service we need or should we maybe do an, an RFP out to see if there's other options out there? Those are very important meetings for your plan, um, not only from a key control standpoint, but just in general, um, that's overseeing um, the actions that are happening for your plan. And as we've talked in other podcasts, there are a lot of class action lawsuits right now going on actually with 401k plans around fees being charged, believe it or not, usage of forfeitures by employers, which we're not going to go into big detail about forfeitures, but um, some things that you would think are kind of obscure, but um, they're multi-million dollar lawsuits um, against companies. So having these meetings, but the important thing is that you're documenting them. And that, that's what we've not been seeing. Um, mm -hmm. Most of our clients have some kind of meeting, can be more often or less often. You can have a lot of people in the meeting, can have fewer people in the meeting. They can talk about different kinds of things at, the, at these meetings. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of, yeah, we have the meetings. Well, did anybody take any notes? No. Do you have an agenda copy of what you talked about? I went, nope, didn't keep it. Uh, can you tell me when it happened? Yeah, no, I don't know. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't keep track of that. Um, so as an auditor now, I'm coming in. You're telling me all this happens, but I've got no proof that it happened. So for me, I have to basically say it didn't happen because I can't see that it happened. I can't. That's part of what I'm doing here is verifying that things are happening that are supposed to be happening. And I can't see that now because there's no documentation. So we've been actually recommending a lot um, this year of document with meeting minutes, document with just handwritten notes. Um, take a, an agenda and make some notes on it of who's there, when did you have it, and here's what we talked about. No Send action is necessary. Send an Send email. Send an email yep. summarizing up what you talked about. Yeah, this does I'm not need to be some big formal, oh, we need yeah. to go hire a stenographer or something. Um, yeah, you know, and, and Kristen, I know, has been doing a lot with AI here, so you can use your AI to just record the meeting <laughs> and let it make the notes. Um, there's a, a lot of different options going on here. Um, you know, that you can take advantage of, but, um, but doing nothing is not a good idea. Um, it, it's it, bad from an audit standpoint, but from just a business and a fiduciary standpoint, if something were to come up and someone's questioning your oversight of the plan, the fact that you don't have any documentation of anything that you're doing, uh, it's not going to serve you very well if you end up in a in a courtroom or in some type of litigation, which is happening, believe it or not, more and more and more and more on 401k plans. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was review of payroll. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of that as well. Um, you know, your your 
uh, company, I'm sure, has some kind of payroll process that you use, um, regardless of what payroll system you're using and how you, how often you're running payroll and what kinds of payroll entries. You probably have some kind of, of procedures in place. They may be documented. They may not. Um, you may have a checklist of things that, that the person is supposed to review prior to actually executing the payroll run. Um, but what we're looking for is some kind of review, approval, authorization. I talked about that at the beginning of the podcast. Again, doesn't have to be a big formal. I've got a big log I sign off on. If you want to do that, that's great. But um, again, send an email and say, hey, yep, checked it. Good to go. Um, or, you know, just have a piece of paper that you're writing down. Yep, so-and-so approved it. Um, there's various ways you can do it. Um, and and we find that a lot of companies do have reviews, mm -hmm. but they're just not documenting anything. Mm -hmm. So Or yeah, maintain, yeah, if, if you set, usually send an email, make sure that there's, you keep the email somewhere yes. just put it into a folder somewhere that says payroll approval or because your auditor may ask to see it yep we've we've been doing a lot of that mm -hmm. <laughs> this past year so um okay well i think we've pretty much covered our topic today i'm, I'm gonna try to um wrap this up you know we've kind of talked about key controls we've talked about why they're important we've given you some good examples uh we could be here all day talking about a uh, full list of key controls and full examples. Uh, so obviously we just hit uh, some some important ones for a 401k plan. Um, there's obviously a lot of others and, and your plan may have some different key controls, which would be totally appropriate. So just because we didn't talk about them doesn't, doesn't mean they wouldn't be important for your plan. Um, you know, from an audit standpoint, your auditor should be looking at that and should be uh, doing walkthroughs and documenting. If they're not, I'd ask them why not, because that's a problem <laughs> in the audit if they're not doing that. Um, you know, it's it's a fair question for you to ask your auditor what what key controls do they have in the work papers. Ask them to see the work paper. That is not out of line for you to be asking for that. And, um, you know, ask what they found, because if they're finding things aren't working right, they should be sharing that information with you. And that gives you the opportunity um, to make some corrections, because ultimately you're responsible for the plan and to make sure that everything operates the way that it's supposed to, regardless of whether there's an audit or not. And so, you know, if, if you have an audit, that's a good opportunity for you to ask the auditor, what are they thinking? What are they seeing? Uh, is there anything that, that you could do better? Um, we always, we've done podcasts about um, kind of best practices for 401k. So you might want to go back and check out that podcast because that will give you some examples of things that if you're looking to improve the controls in your, in your plans, that'll give you some good um, areas to consider. Uh, so check out some of those past uh, podcasts if, if you're interested. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up today's podcast. Karen, Kristen, any last thoughts you want to share with our listeners? Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, as an auditor, doing the walkthrough helps me to educate my client when we come up with exceptions and differences. And sometimes it's just they don't know, you know, I mean, it goes back to you don't know what you don't know. And so when we perform those walkthroughs and we find the exceptions and the errors, it allows us to help educate our clients, you know, so yes. I think I think it's a very good idea to make sure that your auditor is performing walkthroughs to help you identify the key controls that maybe aren't strong in your company. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, yes. And maybe maybe they'll do the walkthroughs and they won't find any issues and they'll tell you that your controls, are, you have good controls and they're operating effectively. Mm -hmm. And that's good information. Yes. I mean, that isn't that isn't a nothing. That's that's good information yes. for you to have. So uh, it also, you know, we and we've talked about this in other podcasts as well. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your plan and to your participants, especially. And, uh, you know, again, if if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out some of those uh, previous podcasts because we talk about that a lot in our in our podcast. Um, but it's very important. And you can be personally liable for things that go wrong in, in the plan that impact participants, um, especially if it's willing going wrong, if, you, if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and it's, and it's causing an error. But even if it's just you didn't know it, but you didn't have proper controls in place to prevent it or detect it, 
that could also cause you problems. Um, and it can be very expensive uh, and can in, even involve jail time. Doesn't happen a lot, but uh, the DOL does go after people um, that are responsible for these plans and, and are doing things that they shouldn't be. So you do have a responsibility. It's important that you understand um, what that responsibility is and that you keep up on what's going on with your plan. And the, the key controls is, is a good area um, for you to focus your time on to make sure that you're that you're addressing all of those things that you should be. With that, I think we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to throw my email address out here one last time. It's the letter K, then more. So K-M-O-O-R-E at Anders with an S, CPA.com. Uh, if this topic piqued your interest and uh, you'd like to talk more about it or you'd just like to talk about Anders 401k audits, um, just email me and we can uh, set up a time to chat. Thank you for listening and we'll catch you next month on the 401k Audit CPA Success Show podcast. Thanks for listening. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website at anderscpa.com slash 401k to get more tips and strategies for achieving 401k audit success. We're here to be a resource with ever-changing rules and regulations.